The lore and characters of Overwatch are easily one of the most fascinating parts of the game and it is what has drawn so many people into the vibrant world it presents. But do you know the backstory of Overwatch, the organization, and how all the vast array of characters that you play in the game fit into its world and existence? Well, if not, I've got you covered. Here is the story of Overwatch, the complete lore history, explained. Now dates themselves are a little unclear in the Overwatch timeline, so we're going to use the animated short Recall as the basis of our timeline. In this first animated short of Overwatch's history, Winston, a former member of Overwatch, returns to its abandoned headquarters and activates a recall for all known previous agents of Overwatch. That is to say, he wants them all to return to action and restart the organization. But why did it shut down in the first place? Well, this is where our story begins. Around 30 years before Recall, a company by the name of Omnica Corporation begins manufacturing Omnics. These were automated machines designed to revolutionize the workforce of the world, providing a cheap and constantly self-improving workforce. Their factories were called Omniums, and Omniums were installed in countries all around the world. But before long, the Omniums began to malfunction, and an investigation of Omnica Corporation showed that they were lying about their expected growth and output, leading to Omnica being dissolved and the Omniums being shut down. Giant machine building corporation went bad? Who would have thought? But for reasons unknown to humanity at the time, the Omniums suddenly started to reactivate and they immediately declared war on humanity. They built massive machines of war and began attacking cities all over the world, all without giving any demands or reason as to their aggression. This would become known as the Omnic Crisis and is one of the most significant events in the history of the Overwatch world. However, we learn later in Overwatch's lore what caused this rise from the Omnics. It all came from an Omnic called Aurora. Aurora was a curious and inquisitive Omnic who traveled the world in search of spiritual and physical enlightenment. Eventually, in Nepal, she would find it and become the first Omnic to gain sentience. That is to say, she had the capacity to feel emotion and think independently. Exactly what happens next is unclear, even to the Omnics themselves, but she took a huge risk. She sacrificed her own life and transcended life itself in order to pass her sentience over to all the Omnics of the world. It is said that she was engulfed in a great golden light and expanded, reaching what the Omnics now call the Iris. The Iris is sort of a spiritual place of enlightenment, and in time, the Omnics would come to build statues and temples dedicated to Aurora, and here they give thanks to her sacrifice and try to achieve the same level of enlightenment that she reached and become one with the Iris through meditation. So, back to the Omnic Crisis, nations around the world were unanimously losing to the Omnics. The very adaptability that made Omnics useful tools of labor made them tactically impossible enemies to defeat. Not a single country around the world was able to shut down even a single Omnium. So the humans were in big trouble. But there were standout individuals who, through their skills and ingenuity, were able to achieve smaller victories, and the United Nations secretly gathered them to form one unified task force. This task force was Overwatch. Jack Morrison, aka Soldier76, Gabriel Reyes, Reaper, Anna Amari, Mina Leao, Reinhard Wilhelm, and Torbjörn Lindholm. These were the six founding members of the organization. In highly secretive missions, they targeted key Omnic strongholds, shutting down their command operations and scattering the Omnic forces, rendering their military inert. One such mission was Operation White Dome, where Torbjörn was gravely injured and rescued valiantly by Reinhardt. In return, Torbjörn allowed Reinhardt to name his daughter for him and also made him her godfather. Eventually, he picked the name Brigitte Lindholm. So after much struggle, sacrifice, and these concerted missions, the Overwatch team brought the Omnic Crisis to an end. The world rejoiced, and Overwatch was lauded as the savior of humanity and a paragon of good and heroism. The organization grew and began to recruit more operatives and even expanded the scope of their missions. With global stability as their objective, Overwatch began to tackle terrorism, dictators, rogue omnic forces, and even natural disasters. With their scientific expertise, they were even able to eradicate epidemics, reverse ecological damage, and develop breakthroughs in medical care. These glory days would continue on for about another two decades. So let's take a look at what was happening to other characters around the world in the meantime. Around 20 years before Recall, in South Korea, an Omnic faction by the name of Guishin began to operate on its own accord. They emerged from an Omnium in the East China Sea, initially in the form of a giant Omnic Colossus, 
that would attack South Korea every few months. In response, the South Korean government created a mechanized armor drone unit called Mecha. The Mecha were able to fight back the Colossus for several years, with every fight ending in a stalemate. Mecha would defeat Guishin, but not destroy them, sending them back to the ocean to bide their time. But eventually, the Colossus and the Guishin were able to adapt, as Omnix were known to do, and were able to interfere with the Mecha's control networks, meaning they couldn't operate on their own anymore. In desperation, the South Korean government would go on to respond by searching for skilled pilots to operate the machines, who became known as the Mecha Squad. In time, they would call upon Hana Song, a world champion esports player known to us as D.Va. Back in America around 20 years before recall, Elizabeth Caledonia Ash is disowned by her parents shortly before her 18th birthday, leading to her masterminding a string of heists against her family's company in revenge. She is soon joined by a man named Cole Cassidy and forms the Deadlock Rebels, aka the Deadlock Gang. Together, they become a notorious crime organization in the American Southwest. Before long though, they are busted via a sting operation by Overwatch and Cassidy is captured and given the choice of rotting in jail or joining them. He opts to join them as part of a new secret sub-organization they were forming called Blackwatch. Blackwatch will be very key to Overwatch's story, but more on that later. At the same time in Australia, things were a lot less rosy. Still around 20 years before recall, the Australian government tried to make peace with the Omnics. They gave a large section of land and the country's Omnium back to the Omnics, hoping that they could encourage a happy coexistence between humans and Omnics. But the land they gave them came at a cost, and a large number of humans were displaced, and furious at this treatment, they formed a group known as the Australian Liberation Front. One of its members was Mako Rutledge, known to us now as Roadhog. They began to retaliate against the Omnics and eventually sabotaged their Omnium, accidentally resulting in an explosion that not only destroyed the facility, but irradiated the entire Australian outback, turning it into the apocalyptic wasteland that it is today. On the ruins of that Omnium though, the survivors formed a home, Junkertown, named after the scrap bits of metal and junk that were used to assemble it, and appropriately, its people would call themselves Junkers. The two initial leaders of Junkertown were Mason Howell and a man known only as Stone. Stone and Howell were war buddies and good friends. However, when it came time for Junkertown to pick a leader, Howell took sole control of the city and banished Stone to the Wasteland along with his wife and children. The Wasteland is a troubled and lawless region outside of Junkertown where the survivors, who call themselves the Wastelanders, are forced to fight not just the harsh environment but also feral Omnics who hold a grudge against humans. Stone perished in the wasteland and was buried there alongside some of his children who also sadly didn't make it. For 13 years, Mason Howe rules Junkertown as its Junker King, participating in several reckonings in the process. The reckonings are a free-for-all arena fight where several participants fight the current ruler of Junkertown for control of the throne. In his 13 years of rule, Mason Howe never lost a single reckoning though it's likely he played some underhanded tricks in order to achieve this feat. Eventually, he is challenged by a wastelander named Odessa Stone, the very daughter of the man he banished to death. Odessa participates in the Reckoning, being the first wastelander to ever do so, and against the odds, she manages to win. With her victory, she is crowned Junker Queen and remains in charge of Junkertown to this day, where she rules with an iron fist and some sick power cords. Back to our timeline though, around 12 years before the recall short, the rest of the world is still feeling the presence of Overwatch, which is still largely seen as a force for good. Over in Japan, the Shimada clan reach a critical juncture in their history. While they were criminals, the Shimada clan had ruled Kanazaka in Japan and the neighboring area for centuries because their illegal activities, that being arms dealing and assassinations, came in combination with the deep respect for the people they were ruling. They firmly believed in honor and loyalty and thus the people of Kanazaka felt safe and happy with the Shimadas in charge. One notable example that demonstrates this relationship is told to us by Kiriko, a young girl who has grown up in Kanazaka and under the wing of the Shimadas, because her mother was the one teaching the Shimada children how to fight. She tells us that every year, Kanazaka holds an end of summer festival where each night its residents leave their homes to watch a grand display of fireworks. A long time ago, a rival clan tried to use this as an opportunity to end the Shimada's rule in Kanazaka. 
With everyone distracted with the fireworks, this rival clan set fire to homes, shrines, and areas of importance to the Shimada, such as the fields that generated them money. They knew that with everyone distracted, the fires would rage unchecked, and they hoped that the Shimadas would immediately have sent some wagons to extinguish the flames in the fields and orchids where their financial interests lie. They figured the Shimada wouldn't bother with helping the people of Kanazaka who would be deemed as a replaceable workforce. So members of this rival clan hid in the fields, waiting to ambush the Shimada when they came. But instead, the Shimada arrived in Kanazaka with water, food, and medicinal supplies to tend to the people. It was only after making sure that the people were alright did the Shimada head to their fields, and the townspeople came with them. When they arrived, they easily outnumbered and defeated their rival clan. However, this didn't stop other clans from trying to usurp the Shimadas, and eventually, around 12 years before the recall short, the Shimada leader Sojiro is assassinated, and it comes time for his son Hanzo to take control of the Shimada clan and the Hanamura castle. As soon as Hanzo becomes the clan's head, its elders demand that he do something about his younger brother Genji, whose easygoing and wayward attitude angered them. Eventually, Hanzo confronts his brother Genji and asks him to take a more involved role in the running of the clan. Unhappy with this idea, Genji refuses and enrages Hanzo with his response. The tension between the two brothers eventually built to a violent confrontation, leading to Hanzo killing Genji, or so he thought. This tragic act breaks Hanzo's heart and he chooses to abandon his clan, which prompts the remaining members of the Shimada clan to mark him as a target for assassination. In reality though, Genji does survive and he was saved by Overwatch and in particular Dr. Angela Ziegler, aka Mercy. Genji's body was rebuilt via cybernetics, and seeing his potential, he was transformed by Overwatch into a living weapon to turn against the Shimada clan and their illegal activities. Genji then single-mindedly sets about the task of dismantling his family's criminal empire and eventually succeeds. This era represents the beginning of a new generation of Overwatch, as new operatives join the organization. On Horizon Lunar Colony, a research base on the moon, scientists were experimenting with genetically enhancing animals, particularly gorillas. One such animal was a monkey who displayed such rapid brain development that Dr. Harold Winston, a scientist on the colony, taught him science and inspired him with tales of human greatness. Eventually though, the other gorillas formed an uprising and killed the scientists on Horizon Lunar Colony. Not wanting to be a part of that, this gorilla took on the name of his mentor Winston and uses an escape pod to make his way to Earth, where he will eventually join Overwatch, an organization that represented everything he admired about humankind. However, in his escape, he leaves behind one of his dear friends, Hammond, a genetically enhanced hamster with remarkable mechanical ability. Like Winston, Hammond escaped the Horizon Lunar Colony when the Gorilla Revolt began, but unlike Winston, his pod broke off and landed in a different location, the wasteland of the Australian Outback. Here, he becomes a mech fighter and eventually the champion of the Scrapyard, a gladiatorial style arena combat that was used in Junkertown as a form of entertainment. Here, he would don the name of Wrecking Ball in reference to the giant mech ball he had created. Another of the new recruits goes by the name of Lena Oxton, hired by Overwatch to test an experimental new plane that was capable of manipulating time. Unfortunately, the plane malfunctioned, and as a consequence, Tracer was affected by something known as chronal disassociation, which meant that she was slipping in and out of our present time. Winston, though, invented a device known as the chronal accelerator, which allowed her to stay anchored in the present time. Additionally, it gave her special abilities that she was then able to use in combat, such as the ability to slow up or speed her own time at will. Among the other new recruits at Overwatch is a significant figure by the name of Moira Odeoren. I'm almost certain I've butchered that Irish pronunciation. Moira was a doctor with dubious morals who believed in scientific advancement at all costs. Though she was previously condemned by Overwatch for some of her questionable actions, she is brought into the now growing secret Black Watch operation run by Gabriel Reyes, aka Reaper. At this point, they've begun conducting more and more audacious operations, eventually culminating in the all-important Operation Retribution. What is Operation Retribution? Well, we're now around 8 years before the recall short, and Overwatch's facilities in Oslo are attacked by a group called Talon. Talon began as a mercenary group during the Omnic Crisis, but eventually grew in power and began to influence world governments and global operations. This attack on the Oslo facilities triggers Operation Retribution, where Overwatch sent a strike team to Rialto, Venice, where a key Talon headquarters lie. The strike team consists of Moira, Reyes, Genji, and Cassidy, 
Together, they infiltrate and reach Antonio, the man who masterminded the attack on Oslo. But even when he's confronted by the team, Antonio simply mocks Overwatch and laughs at their inability to do anything against him, since they were bound by moral and legal codes. In a fit of rage though, Reyes kills Antonio and creates a highly dangerous situation where the strike team is barely able to make a risky exit. However, the cause of Reyes' reckless actions is that the public now learn about the operations of Blackwatch. This truly represents the beginning of the downfall of Overwatch, as the public now sees a new side to the organization that was previously only thought to be doing good. This side, Blackwatch was willing to do underhanded and illegal things, included cold-blooded murder. Trust now begins to erode in the organization of Overwatch, and it inspires many people to rise up against them, including a man by the name of Akande Ogondimu. Once more, I am really really sorry to the people whose names I'm butchering who takes on the mantle of Doomfist and eventually becomes a high-ranking Talon member. After Operation Retribution, things start going wrong much more frequently for Overwatch as well. They're forced to shut down their base in Cairo, leading to the massive destabilization of the region. One of their leaders, Gerard Lacroix, is killed and not just by any assassin, but rather his wife, Amelie, who was brainwashed by Talon and turned into a sleeper agent. As a result of killing her husband, she will be given the moniker of Widowmaker. All these events lead to the world's nations trusting Overwatch a lot less. And at that very time, an organization known as Null Sector emerges in the United Kingdom in response to the harsh treatment that they received from the government there. In the United Kingdom at the time, Omnix were denied basic rights and legal freedoms, and many felt as though they were being treated like criminals or under military occupation, and they were routinely victims of police brutality and general mistreatment by law enforcement. Null Sector was formed as a response to all of this, and they eventually began to wreak havoc in the streets of London. But even as Overwatch offered to intervene, the British government forbade them. Flagrantly ignoring that decision, Jack Morrison sends a strike team down to help, and although Overwatch manages to save the day, it comes at the cost of an escalating distrust from the world at large. People around the world now start to question if Overwatch is not just some rogue organization that acts with its own will and for its own interests, rather than a force for public good. There are a few wins in this period though, and a few successful operations that see Overwatch claiming big wins. One such example is a fight in Singapore, where Winston, Tracer and Genji are able to combine to bring down Doomfist. Doomfist it turns out was a key orchestrator in Null Sector's uprising, and putting him away served as a huge blow to Talon. But that joy doesn't last long. Tensions were rising within the Overwatch organization itself, and Cole Cassidy decides to leave rather than be forced to pick a side in the growing civil war. Genji, having successfully dismantled the Shimada crime organization, finds himself unable to live with what he had become, a weapon and not a person. He too leaves Overwatch, deciding to search the world for inner peace. All of this culminates in a huge fight between the two primary figures of Overwatch, Jack Morrison and Gabriel Reyes. The details of their battle are unknown, but we do know that it was devastating, causing an explosion in the Swiss headquarters of Overwatch that destroys the entire base and has the world assuming that both men are dead. In reality, they both survive. Reyes was saved by Moira, who found him near death and injected him with an experimental chemical that makes his cells simultaneously decay and regenerate at a hyper-accelerated rate. In effect, this means that he can be human flesh one minute and then black mist the next, alternating between these states of matter. In this new form, he took on the name of Reaper and continues down the dark path he had already started. How Jack Morrison survives is unclear, but we do know that he would re-emerge years later as an independent vigilante under the name of Soldier 76. With these two men presumed dead, command of Overwatch is given to Vivian Chase, codenamed Sojourn, a Canadian cybernetics expert who had been coordinating many of Overwatch's missions already. The world is shocked by the news of the violence of Overwatch's leaders and the self-destructive fight they had. It triggers an inquiry by the United Nations, and that inquiry finds out all about the shady operations that Overwatch, and Blackwatch in particular, had been conducting. Left with no choice, the world decides to outlaw Overwatch in what would be called the Petrus Act. All activities from the organization were henceforth made illegal, and Overwatch is officially disbanded. That then brings us to the recall short. It's been five years since the Petrus Act that disbanded Overwatch and its various members were made to scatter around the world. All of them by this point have either moved on with their lives or are forced to operate in secret for fear of being punished. 
the influence of both Talon and Null Sector have continued to grow around the world, even as heroes like Winston and Tracer continue to operate on their own accord to protect the world. It is basically around this time period in which most of the Overwatch animated shorts take place. Let's quickly run through these shorts and what they tell us about the Overwatch story during this time period. In the Alive short, Widowmaker is planning to assassinate Takarta Mondata, a significant figure amongst the Omnic community with a growing following around the world who wants to see humans and Omnics live together peacefully. Mondata is part of the Shambhali order of monks who hope to spread a positive and empathetic message around the world. At this point, Widowmaker, who you will remember was brainwashed into becoming a Talon member, is working alongside Reaper and Mora, both formerly of Overwatch, but now bad guys. Despite Tracer's best attempts to stop Widowmaker though, Mondata is assassinated and this is a huge blow to world peace. We know that Doomfist of Talon was key in orchestrating the original Null Sector Uprising, and so killing an advocate for interspecies peace like Mondata is very likely to cause more anger amongst the Omnic community and escalate the situation, especially since this takes place in King's Row, London, where the Null Sector Uprising originally took place and where Omnics still feel mistreated by the local government. The next short we see is Dragons, in which Hanzo infiltrates his former home of Shimada Castle to pay respects to his dead brother Genji. Only, while he's doing this, he's interrupted by a man who he thinks is an assassin sent to kill him. In truth, it is none other than his brother, Genji, alive and now in his new android form. The two fight and Genji defeats Hanzo, revealing his identity to his brother, a revelation that shocks Hanzo. Last we saw of Genji, he had quit Overwatch and was traveling the world in search of answers and he finds them in Nepal alongside Zenyata, a Shambhali monk who teaches him the way of meditation and inner peace. With that new mindset, Genji tells Hanzo that he has forgiven him and that he wants him to move on with his life and contribute to a positive impact in the world. Next is the short Hero, which shows us that Jack Morrison is still alive, fighting as a vigilante in locations around the world to combat injustice. He's now referred to as Soldier 76, and though he doesn't wish to rejoin Overwatch, he still hopes the world can find peace once more. In Infiltration, we learn of Sombra, one of the world's most skilled hackers who seems to be a part of Talon and helps them attempt to break into Volskaya Industries, a factory where the Russian government are building giant mechs to combat any future Omnic uprisings. Talon's plan is to kill Katya Volskaya, their leader, presumably in a further attempt to hamper human Omnic relations. However, it turns out that Sombra is working to a goal of her own and sabotages the mission, instead using it as an opportunity to blackmail Katya for herself. She sees having such a powerful friend as a potential asset for the future. In Honor and Glory, we see that Reinhardt has now retired to his home of Eichenwald, where he's weighing up Winston's recall and whether he wants to join Overwatch again. Here with Brigitta, his mechanic and goddaughter, he reminisces about his younger days as a foolhardy crusader, whose reckless actions cost the life of his then master, Bolderich von Adler. Remembering the promise he made to protect others as a crusader, Reinhardt decides that he will return and help Overwatch. In Shooting Star, we see a typical attack on South Korea from the Guishin we spoke of before. As they come for Busan, we see D.Va single-handedly drive them back while <sighs> looking so beautiful. In Rise and Shine, we meet Mei, an ecological scientist who had been working for Overwatch many years ago to combat unexpected climate phenomenon which had been increasingly occurring around the world. However, when a particularly bad polar storm battered her base in Antarctica, she and the other scientists decide to put themselves in cryostasis while they wait for a rescue team to arrive. Upon waking up, Mei learns that several years have passed since that time. In a tragic reveal, she realizes that the other scientists' pods had malfunctioned and that she is now the sole survivor. As she catches up on world history and learns of Overwatch's downfall, she determines herself to help wherever and however she can. The final short to mention is The Last Bastion, though this short actually takes place many years in the past, around 15 years before Recall. It shows an abandoned Bastion unit, one of the many Omnic types that was used for combat during the Omnic Crisis. Traumatized by its past, it threatens to return to its primary mission of waging war against humans, but when it's comforted by a little bird named Ganymede, it opts instead for a life of peace and retreats back into the forest. Many years later, this Bastion unit would meet with Torbjörn in Sweden, where an initially skeptical Torb learns to trust Bastion and they join together as an unlikely duo. Outside of all of this, though, it's clear that the conflict is escalating around the world and nefarious forces are building strength. 
demanding a response from the heroes of the world. Doomfist, for example, managed to escape from prison and returns to being a high-ranking leader in the Talon organization. Together with an Omnic known as Maximilian, they begin to plot a plan to manipulate the world to their will. This brings us to the most recent lore events leading right up to the launch of Overwatch 2. In many ways, Overwatch 2 is an appropriate name from a lore perspective because it represents a new version of Overwatch with a new guard of characters. The main player in this is Cole Cassidy. Cassidy receives a call from his former captain Ana Amari to meet him in Cairo. He, like all the other former Overwatch agents, has received a recall from Winston and is considering whether he wants to return or not. In his time away, he's simply been acting on his own, still largely doing good deeds, such as saving a precious piece of Overwatch cargo from being hijacked and sold to the highest bidder by his former Deadlock rebels, led solely now by Ash. This cargo is in fact Echo, an Omnic AI designed by and modeled after Dr. Mina Liao, one of the original members of the Overwatch crew. So reuniting with Anna, Cassidy encourages her to return and become the new leader of Overwatch. But Anna declines, saying that it's time for a new generation to take the helm. A new generation she wants Cassidy to lead. She gives him the information of new heroes around the world who she thinks will be willing to help, and reluctantly accepting that mission, Cassidy travels around the world looking to recruit new exceptional individuals to the resurgent Overwatch mission. He finds first Anna's daughter, Farah, and she agrees to join him followed by Batiste, a former Talon agent who turned coat, and Zarya, a Russian war hero. In the meantime though, what we have is probably the most single important moment in recent world history occur in Paris. Null Sector launch a full-scale invasion of the city of Paris, destroying large parts of it and hurting thousands of civilians. By this point, May has now joined Winston and Tracer as part of their ragtag Overwatch recreation and they head over to defend the city. But when a giant Null Sector robot appears, it seems that they may well be outmatched. That's when timely interventions from Genji, Reinhardt, Brigitte, Echo and Mercy save the day and see Overwatch officially return for the first time since it was outlawed those many years ago. Also, it cements Genji's place as the coolest character in this game because, come on man, how freaking badass is this? How can you not be mega hype when he pulls out? The world ponders the implications of all this, particularly about Null Sector, who seem to be escalating their operations around the world. What are their plans? Who will be their next target? It is at this point that Busan in South Korea is attacked, not by Guishin, but by Null Sector. And once more, the Mecha Squad are scrambled to intervene. In a tough battle against overwhelming numbers, they fear they might be losing. When onto the scene arrive Cassidy and his recently recruited squad. Together with Mecha Squad, they beat back the Null Sector forces and save the city. As a result of this, D.Va is given permission to join Overwatch, and she, alongside Cassidy, Farah, Batiste and Zarya, head over to the Overwatch base in Gibraltar, where Winston initiated his recall launch. They go with a renewed sense of hope and optimism, hoping to restart Overwatch once more, this time the right way. And that is it, for now. This is where the story will continue now in Overwatch 2, and particularly during the PvE content. How will Overwatch be received by the public? Will they welcome them back or see them as a dangerous outlaw group? What is Null Sector planning? Do they want to assert Omnic supremacy and eradicate organic life? Or do they simply perceive that they have not been given equal rights and want that instead? And what of Talon? What are their plans in all of this? Well, find out next time on Overwatch Lore. And that's all I've got for today. Thank you for watching this video and if you've enjoyed it then please consider supporting me directly via Patreon and becoming a patron of mine. I'd like to thank all my current patrons without whose support I would not be able to make videos like this. I'd also like to thank Dr. Six whose incredible lore gathering work was a big reason I was able to make this video at all. I don't know about you but I'm incredibly excited to see what the story of Overwatch has in store for us in Overwatch 2. But that's it from me. I'll be back before you know it with another video. See you guys soon.